And again, just to mention that I am from Kujuak. I now live in Nunavut. You will see just the remarkable, majestic pictures of the Arctic behind me. And I'm sure by the end of this speech, having seen all of that, you will all want to fly to the Arctic tomorrow. And I was born, of course, very traditionally, traveling only by dog team the first 10 years of my life. And now, in one lifetime, we have come from that very traditional way of life to one where now I fly jumbo jets around the world, oftentimes to negotiate help UN treaties, just to give you that picture of how quickly things have changed for our world. So as the Arctic ice melted this summer at a staggering, completely unexpected rate, the Arctic has secured its place once and for all as the world's climate change barometer. And we Inuit are the mercury in that barometer. Our hunters are, in fact, the sentinels in that, for the rest of the planet. And what is happening in the Arctic now will soon happen. And in fact, I have been saying for years that it will soon happen, but now we see that it's already happening. And all through all of this tumultuous change in our world, we have had our land. We've had our ice. We've had our snow. And the wisdom of our traditional knowledge, our hunters, and our elders. And for hunting, as a hunting culture, there are few people in the world who really truly understand the power and the process of the hunting culture, that it is not just about the killing of animals. The process of the hunt and the eating of our country food personifies what it really means to be Inuit. It is on the land that the values and the age-old knowledge are passed down from generation to generation. And the children who are taught on the land by the very nature of the wisdom of the land are taught the character building. By nature of the, the land and the wisdom of the land, it is not just the technical aspects of a hunt that we talk about. It is how to, teaching our children to be patient, how to be bold under pressure, how to withstand stress, how to be courageous, how not to be impulsive, how to have sound judgment, ultimately to be wise. Those are skills, naturally, that a hunting culture teaches to survive the land, but it also is very transferable to the modern world, where our young people oftentimes are not making it in this new world order of globalization. We are known to have the highest suicide rates in North America. We are now trying to recognize what has happened to us in our world, and we are trying to address this issue for our children and the future of what they will hold for them. So when you talk about climate change and you hear about it in the Arctic, don't just think ice. Don't just think polar bears. Think about the young people that we are trying to gain back that grounding, that wisdom for them, and what the hunting culture offers to young people for the opportunities and the challenges of life. That's what this issue is about for us. And in the North, climate change affects virtually every facet of Inuit life. Already we're having difficulty adapting to changes as a result of climate change. Our hunters are now rerouting themselves where they used to be able to go very safely and quickly to certain areas. We have lost lives as a result of it because of the melting glaciers that have now turned streams into torrent rivers. But the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment foresees a time well within the lifetime of my own 10-year-old grandson when environmental change will be so great that we will have a great deal of difficulty maintaining our hunting culture as we know it today. So global warming, climatic changes do become the ultimate threat to Inuit culture and to our survival as an indigenous people. There are some wise people in Oslo that have recently hinted that climate change is now indeed more than an issue of environment. It is indeed a matter of peace. And just last month, with scientists around the world stunned by this summer's enormous and never before sea ice melt, the most dire predictions now look toward an ice-free Arctic Ocean 
by the summer of 2013. That's not very far from now. And despite the incredible urgency of the situation, states and our international institutions have not yet mounted an adequate response. And I ask you this question. How would you respond if an international assessment concluded that your age-old culture and economy could very well be doomed? And how would you respond if your ancient way of life was destined to become a footnote in the history of globalization? And we have to regain back this human perspective if we are to slow down and eventually stop human-induced climate change. In our Inuit language, in what we call, we call Inuktitut, my language, my mother tongue, we have a word, word called sila. Sila means the air, the weather, the atmosphere. But it's also a word for intelligence and consciousness and wisdom. It is understood to be the fundamental principle underlying the natural world. Sila connects a person with the rhythms of the universe, integrating the self with the natural world. And for Inuit, we are all connected, physically, spiritually, and of course, through our common atmosphere. We must correct the global imbalances caused by the great disconnections that have grown between us. And climate change science tells us that a window of opportunity, while brief, yet remains to save the Arctic and ultimately the planet. So coordinated action by the developed and developing countries can still forestall the future projected in the ACIA and can reserve our human rights. And that is the way in which we can change the world is by building partnerships and working very closely together with the wisdom of indigenous peoples of this country. We do not want to be just powerless victims over the matter on what is happening in our world because we have many things to offer. We, after all, have lived for millennia sustainably with much respect for all that is around us, our environment, our ecosystem. We have yet to deplete any species of our animals. I believe that 2007 will be known as the year our climate changed, the year we accepted our common problem and together committed ourselves to the common solutions that you will be all discussing in the coming days. And to spur these solutions, I look forward to the greatest emitters translating their new resolve into firm, binding commitments, and of course, to be able to share equally the burdens of emissions reductions, or equitably. Mitigating the worst impacts of climate change will require a dramatic global effort to implement new technologies and alternative sustainable energy systems. And many of these have already been developed. So it is now time for nations to implement strong policies that spread these advances through all the sectors. And I look forward as well to the wealthy developed nations that surround the Arctic behaving with care and with foresight as they determine the new uses of the new sea you see, as long as it was ice, nobody cared, except us, the Inuit of the Arctic, because we have been on there for thousands of years. But now it's become water. Everybody wants a piece of it for their own devices. You can well imagine how worried we are as to what will happen now. So let us make the peaceful, cooperative, sustainable management of the Arctic a model for the globe a shining example at the top of the world of how nations can overcome their differences and share our world's precious renewable resources. Let us take opportunities like this to remind ourselves of our shared humanity. The ice has its own warmth, has its own purpose in this huge world of ours, and let's try to keep the Arctic as cold as possible, we will not only guard it for ourselves, but for the rest of the world. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. <laughs>